doctors who are attending today, um, your colleagues, are really interested in learning about how the office lease agreement can either facilitate or uh, perhaps hinder the ability they have to sell the practice. And so I'd like to kind of start off by giving you some background with respect to why we've decided to put on this presentation and educate um, the dental industry and particularly dental practice owners on the notion of ensuring that their lease agreements are thousand dental office lease agreements across uh, North America. Out of those, we end up negotiating more than 500 lease agreements annually, and we do keep track of all the critical dates for each of these lease agreements to ensure that you are not missing a critical opportunity to Quite the role of time plays an integral um, and key component. Dental industry events, including the Pacific Dental Conference, the Yankee Dental Conference. Uh, I know that many of you are planning to attend the California Dental Association convention next week. In terms of the doctors that we've worked with all across the U.S., a combination of doctors looking to set up a practice for the first time, those associated have a need uh, to negotiate with multiple landlords, and we get heavily involved with doctors looking to expand our office and um, looking to sell their practice. And uh, we are, uh, this is really the beginning of a, a series of webinars that we're going to be delivering. And uh, they're going to essentially uh, serve a different purpose. Today's webinar is really going to be geared towards those of you who are looking to sell the practice. And we'll talk about how the lease agreement factors into the, the sale value of your practice if you happen to lease the premises that you're in. And for those of you that are owners of the property you're located in will discuss why you have to have a lease agreement despite the fact that you are the owner and occupier today if your plan is you see and this is a very small subset of the doctors that we have had the pleasure of working with uh, recently, and um, again, a combination of dentists who are first-time practice owners, those who are looking at selling their practice, and a lot of mid-career doctors seeking to have their lease agreement uh, renewed and uh, enabled to increase practice value. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the purpose of today and the reason why all of us are attending this webinar is to ensure that we understand how the lease agreement can either inhibit or facilitate your ability as a practice owner to eventually sell the practice. We're going to spend some time over the next 50 minutes discussing the key terms within the dental office lease and also really give you some practical advice on negotiating lease agreements ahead of a practice. It is a task that needs to be taken care of when you have found a buyer. And in, in most cases, when you found a buyer for your practice, and then you approach the landlord to decide to whether or not you want to transfer the lease agreement or renegotiate the lease agreement, and many times you have a very limited amount of time to negotiate. You have a very limited window to get the changes that you need and that window is not going to be sufficient. The buyer typically is going to be impatient. They're not going to want to wait several months to have your lease agreement properly set up. And I say several months because you can negotiate rental rates over three or four phone calls. 
but what about all the legal terms within your lease agreement? Can that be negotiated over a span of a week or two weeks? Or is the reality today that if your landlord happens to own multiple properties, your request to have your lease agreement transferred to the buyer of the practice may be in the bottom of their to-do list. It may not be a priority for them, and yet you as a practice owner have a pending sale of $600,000, $800,000, and that sale needs And with that said, you know, what is a lease agreement? When you think about a lease agreement for your practice, what, what do you think about? The way we like to look at a lease agreement is it's really the biggest check that many of you are going to sign and have signed during your career. And, and like a check, a lease agreement identifies who you pay to, how much you pay, and how frequently you make that payment. Now, the difference between a lease agreement and a check is that a lease agreement, unlike a check, comes with dozens upon dozens of binding provisions that either increase your liability and decrease practice value or help you reduce your liability and maximize the sale price of your practice. And we'll discuss momentarily how that works. And why is this document so important? When you think about a lease agreement, typically doctors who are looking to sell their practice, they understand that with respect to practice sale, obviously having sufficient patience and having a sufficient goodwill is critical to ensuring that they can maximize their ability to sell the practice. But why is a document, a legal document like a lease agreement, so important? When you think about practice ownership, first and foremost, the lease agreement is a mechanism that provides you with long-term stability and security. What do I mean by long-term stability? A practice owner today should ideally have a 10-year lease agreement with multiple options to renew. And the reason I say that is because most of you tend to practice in the same location for a very long period of time. In fact, for many of you, you're going to be practicing in a location until you decide to transition, unless you're being forced to relocate by your landlord, which, by the way, happens more often than not. Um, a lot of your colleagues, unfortunately, put themselves in a situation whereby they sign owner's lease agreements that prevent them from practicing in the same location and uh, are forced to relocate. Um, in many cases, mid-career or even closer to uh, a transition point. Um, so ideally, the lease agreement, if it's structured properly, will provide you with long-term stability. A 10-year term is typically the term that we recommend, plus multiple options to renew the lease agreement for periods of typically five years. With respect to security, what we were implying here is that the lease agreement should ideally allow you to practice in that location and ensure that you are not forced to have downtime because of certain events that might happen. So for example, yesterday I was speaking with a doctor uh, in Alberta, Canada, and it just so happens that his landlord is going through the process of renovating the property. And through this renovation project, he has been forced to shut down his office on and off for several weeks. Nothing in his lease agreement says anything about the fact that the landlord during a renovation process can or cannot have him or force him to shut down his office for a period of few days and then be back up and running and then be forced to shut down again. Uh, and there's a lot of problems that he's having now with the HVAC unit that's being installed and, and the list goes on. So needless to say, it's critical that this document you have is not one which is ambiguous. Right, it really clearly defines what the tenant's rights are and what the landlord's rights are. And if there's an event of a dispute, that are 
watching today's webinar have signed a lease agreement whereby you have personally signed that document. And the name of the tenant on the lease agreement is that of your personal name and not the name of your, for example, professional corporation or your limited liability company if you're a, a doctor practicing in the States or your Procorp. And so really it comes down to ensuring that if you've signed a lease agreement, you know, is that document or that contract between you and the landlord personally or is it between your business and the landlord? Uh, how many times have you actually read the lease agreement whereby the name of the landlord is a person? In most cases, the name of the landlord is a corporation. And the reason why landlords sign lease agreements under their corporate name is because they themselves as an individual do not want to expose their assets to a lawsuit should there ever be damages awarded in the favor of a tenant, they're going to limit their liability to the business entity and not themselves personally. So similarly, many doctors get into a situation where they're negotiating a lease agreement, and yet they're agreeing that they're going to be personally guaranteeing the performance. of the contract. The lease agreement should also maximize your flexibility as a practice owner. Those of you looking to your practice when you deem it to be suitable. You know, some doctors decide to sell their practice to the associate working in the and getting the patients to feel comfortable that this associate is one day going to run the practice. Now, I understand that some doctors have challenges in implementing this strategy, but it is a strategy that some of your colleagues have utilized in the past. Who's now going to be running the office. The lease should also provide you with fair and affordable financial terms. It's very evident that doctors across North America, in comparison to other types of tenants and other retail tenants, tend to pay more on a the negotiation of the economic components of the lease. And what I mean by that is when you between a tenant who has the research and the representation when they're negotiating a rental rate is that they can make a very a situation where, number one, they do not start negotiations ahead of the practice sale, and they put themselves in a situation where they found a buyer for the practice, or they maybe have multiple bids. Then they approach the landlord, and they want to now extend a term or transfer the lease agreement. At that point in time, depending on how much term is left on the lease agreement, the landlord may decide, I'm not going to play ball. And in fact, I'm not going to give you the concessions you want because what is the worst case scenario? Are you going to relocate your business as a dental practice owner? Most dentists cannot afford to relocate their practice once they've decided to build out. Now, there's a relocation strategy with respect to growing the practice, and I'm all for that. In fact, we do recommend doctors that are in a position where they have really outgrown their space to have a conversation with their equipment supplier, um, with the designer. The growth is key prior to selling a practice because you don't want to put the buyer of the practice in a situation where they're inheriting your practice and it's already maximized its capacity. It's already maximized its production capability. So it's critical that you 
properly negotiate the rental rates ahead of a sale because the buyer, when they're looking at the lease agreement, they're going to factor in as a percentage of your gross collection, what is your rent rate? Is it 5%, 6%, 7% of your gross collection in terms of a ratio? Um, and is it in line with what they're seeing as far as other practices that are for sale? And last but not least, the lease agreement should enhance your ability to eventually sell your practice. And we'll spend a little bit of time discussing why and how that works. When you're looking at selling a general dental practice, and many of you who are attending today's webinar are general dentists, there are really three key determinants of practice value within a general dental office. The first component of the way and what the process with respect to evaluating a practice, you want to look at the equipment. And when an appraiser is higher to put a value on your practice. Uh, you know, Cirrus Consulting Group, we're not practice brokers. We don't sell practices. We also do not appraise practices. We appraise the lease agreement, but we don't appraise the actual equipment. And when the appraiser comes in, having spoken with many appraisers in my career, typically when they're looking at the equipment, they'll determine, you know, what was the value of the equipment when you bought it? And it's really a depreciation exercise, right? Depending on how that equipment is, they're going to determine how much is that equipment depreciated over its lifetime, and it's really an accounting exercise. And the value of the equipment when the appraiser comes in your practice can be determined very accurately, and it's really black and white. The second component that gets evaluated when you're looking to sell your practice is the goodwill component. And what do I mean by goodwill for dental office? Goodwill for a dental office is essentially your, your patient charts, right? How many active patients do you have? How often are they coming to the practice? What is the average production per patient? What percentage of your gross production is attributed to your hygiene department? And what percentage of it is really one-time treatments or you know, more complicated cases whereby they're not easily replicatable or they're not resulting in recurring revenue for your practice? And have So with respect to the goodwill component, working with the right the third component with respect to the determinant of practice value is the location. When I get contacted by young doctors looking to set up an office, the number one thing I hear is, see now, I want a great location. With respect to doctors purchasing a practice, what they tell me is, Sina, I want a, a great practice that has a great patient base, but more importantly, I want a location that I can be in for the next 25 plus years. Because what's the point of buying a dental practice if I have to physically move the equipment? And the question is, will the patients follow? We know that from our experience, for every mile or kilometer that you move to the practice, there will be patient attrition. Now, depending on the consultant you speak with, there's different percentages, but the consensus is that if you end up moving your practice three miles away, not every single one of those patients will certainly follow you, and that's basically common sense. I mean, think about you yourself as a patient and whether or not you would follow the doctor regardless of how far they went, and really part of it is the clinical um, service. And, and your ability to deliver that, but a big part of it is convenience. I mean, patients, you know, value convenience. And so if you're forced to buy a practice, in your case, if you're selling a practice and buyer knows that they're going to have to move this practice because you don't have enough lease term, because your lease expires in 2019, or alternatively, because the landlord, you know, has inserted provisions in the lease, they give them too much flexibility, then what are they buying? And so the lease and the location, and when I say lease, for those of you that are in a space today, you're either owners or alternatively, you're renters. And if you're a renter, what glues your equipment and your business together is the lease agreement. Because without the lease agreement, what are you left with? You can sell your equipment for pennies on the dollar, and you can sell your patient charts perhaps to an existing practice owner. If you're lucky enough, they're in your building and they put enough value. But if they're in your building, 
chances are the patients are coming there after you're gone, so you know, is it really worth it for them to pay you what you're asking for? Just acquire your patient charts. Now I want to talk a little bit about, we've already discussed the importance of the dental office lease. We've talked about why the practice value is partially determined by the lease you have and the location you have. But what are the common provisions that are found in lease agreements that affect practice owners looking to transition? The most important provision within a dental office lease by far for a doctor today who is looking at selling their practice over the next three to five years is the assignment provision. And if you have signed a lease agreement, I want you to take your highlighter and I want you to find the assignment section in your lease. And by the way, make sure you're not marking up the original copy. Um, make yourself an additional copy. Find the assignment section or what's called a transfer provision in your lease agreement and, and read it and highlight it. Uh, the assignment provision is found in 75% of the dental office lease agreements that our firm reviews. If your lease agreement does not have an assignment provision, nothing in your lease agreement discusses allow you to transfer the lease. They can set the rules when you approach them with respect to a transfer. If you read this example, this is an example of an assignment provision that was directly taken from one of our client's lease agreements. And for the purposes of confidentiality, what we have essentially done is we've eliminated the name of the doctor so that their name doesn't appear in this paragraph. But what I want you to do is I want you to take a minute right now and just read this paragraph and determine if you were the type of tenant who had this provision, this assignment provision in your lease agreement, whether or not you'd feel comfortable approaching your landlord and requesting that they transfer your lease agreement to the buyer or the potential buyer of your practice. And I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, if I'm looking to sell my practice, why not allow the buyer to negotiate directly with the landlord a new lease term? What do I have to transfer my existing lease? And the simple answer is, if you rely on the buyer to negotiate term with the landlord, the light bulb is going to go off in the landlord's head. They're going to realize that you're putting them in a great position to negotiate rent. They're going to ask for more rent. Why? Because they don't have anything to lose. What you In this case scenario, the landlord scares away the buyer of your practice, yet they own the leasehold improvement, so they can turn it around and market the space if you don't continue occupying it as a built-out dental office. And I guarantee in most markets, they're going to get competing offers. With respect to this assignment provision, the alarming thing that we find with most assignment provisions is that when the landlord is requested to transfer a lease agreement from you to the buyer of the practice, they do have the right, instead of agreeing to a consent or giving consent, they have the right to either terminate the lease agreement outright, and I'll tell you why that is, or to revise the minimum rent and adjust that minimum rent to what they believe to be either market rent or, in this case, 15% greater than the then current rental rate in your lease agreement. And the reason why the landlord wants to provide themselves when they engineer these lease agreements to terminate the lease is very simple. If you want to get more rent, which is what every landlord wants, the minute that the current tenant says to you, I'm looking to transfer my lease agreement, if you have negotiated or pre-negotiated in the lease this provision, what it allows you to do essentially is say, Dr. Smith, thank you very much for your tenancy over the last 25 years. And we like the fact that you've come to us and you've essentially taken the liberty of finding a 
future tenant for a property instead of leaving the space empty, we will allow that prospective tenant to get into a contract with us. But the only thing we're going to ask is that we have direct communications with this young doctor that you have found. And what happens from that point forward is the landlord renegotiates everything in your lease agreement. And there's no guarantee that they're going to give the buyer the same rental rate. There's no guarantee that they're going to give the buyer the same term. They can present a more onerous lease agreement to the purchaser of your practice. And what does that do? Either the purchaser walks away, or alternatively, the purchaser comes back to you if they made their offer to purchase the practice conditional on negotiation of the lease agreement. They'll approach you, and they will say to you that I'm not going to offer the, uh, the asking price because of what's just happened and the fact that the landlord is now asking me to pay more rent, I'm going to adjust my offer accordingly. So that's the first problem. You're basically giving the landlord, when you assign your lease agreement, too much flexibility because your lease is engineered in such a way that allows the landlord to either terminate the lease agreement or to revise the minimum rent. The second biggest problem we find in transfer provisions within lease agreements is related to what we call in the legal community as continuous liability. And what's continuous liability? It's the notion that you as the assignor, so if you're the existing tenant and you want to transfer your lease agreement, you're called an assignor, you as an assignor have liability despite the fact that the landlord has already agreed to transfer the lease. So if you have a landlord who's kind enough to allow you to transfer the lease agreement, what the landlord is ensuring is that in the event a buyer of your practice does not pay them rent, they have a mechanism from going back to you and collecting that outstanding rent. And this is what we refer to as continuous liability. And if you look at the paragraph on your screen, what it's basically saying is that in the last sentence, notwithstanding the landlord's consent to any assignment, this is assuming the landlord decides I'm going to agree to allowing you to transfer the lease agreement, the tenant shall not be released from its obligations under the lease and shall remain liable for any failure of the tenant or its assignees or subtenants to observe each and every covenant of the lease. And we had a situation not too long ago where one of our clients was selling her practice. She approached the landlord with respect to selling the practice. The landlord presented her with three options. Option one was an immediate termination of the lease agreement. Option two was a 42% increase in rent. And option three was agreeing to allow the lease to be assigned on the condition that the owner of the practice paid the landlord 25% of the proceeds of the sale of the practice. And how is the landlord able to ask for sale proceeds? When a practice is appraised, there is a direct dollar value placed on leasehold improvements. Unlike many other retail and office tenants, dentists spend a lot of money per square foot building at their office. The landlord legally owns the leasehold improvements. And if the landlord is able to demonstrate that part of the asset you're selling has to do and is attributable to the leasehold improvements in addition to the goodwill of the location, they can make a very strong legal case as to why in order for them lease agreements and some of your lease agreements state verbatim that in the event of an assignment, if the landlord agrees to an assignment, you as a tenant shall pay X percentage of and in lease agreements, especially those lease agreements for tenants that are in shopping centers and retail centers are the landlord's right to relocate. This is called the relocation clause, very simply. Now, in your lease agreement, it's not going to be typically titled as relocation provision. Sometimes it's buried in your lease agreement, and it's hard to find. You know, we typically like to have a look at the table of contents and then have a run through the lease agreement. And what we're finding now is because of what's happening in the commercial real estate industry, there's
And landlords want flexibility. The relocation provision was really intended to allow landlord to shift it around tenants to be able to optimize the tenant mix within their property. I got a problem with my hands, right? I got to find a 3,000 unit, and sometimes I got to combine. All this. So when it comes down to it, a relocation provision is not beneficial because it doesn't allow you to do the plan relocation. If you're working with a consultant and you're doing a plan relocation, great. There's a purpose behind. is never good, and usually what happens is the practice is forced to shut down for an extended period of time. In fact, the relocation provision that you see before you essentially says in the lease agreement in the commercial real estate industry, if you move a tenant from down in size by 100 or 200 square feet. You're not exposing yourself as a landlord to any sort of lawsuit. Um, yet that's a problem for dental office because if you're moved to a location that is a couple hundred square feet larger or bigger, if it's bigger, you're going to pay more rent. If it's smaller, you're going to essentially not be able to run the same number of operatories in that location. What if I told you you're being moved to a space that's configured like a bowling alley? This is going to present significant challenges when you sell your practice. Why? Because the buyer is going to look at it and say, why would I pay you the asking price if the landlord at any given time can relocate me to a different unit? And I'm then forced to build out the practice again. And the landlord in this case is only paying for the physical relocation of the premises, which means that they're going to essentially move the equipment. They're not going to plumb out a brand new office. And all incidental costs as per Section C of this provision stated that will be capped at with respect to having relocation provision in the lease agreement. And they said, I don't care. I'm still interested in buying your practice. Great. They're going to approach the bank, if, unless they have the cash in the bank, uh, to do a cash deal. They're going to approach their bank to obtain They're going to look at their debt and assets, and then they're also going to look at, does this individual have a location? Are they buying a practice? And the way a lease agreement is treated with the relocation clause is that underwriters typically look at the term of the relocation. If it's within 30 days or 60 days notice, for all they care, you could have a lease agreement that's 30 or 60 days, despite the fact that it expires in 2025. And so having sufficient security really also comes down to making sure that the landlord cannot serve you with notices that force you to be out of your existing premises. The third most common provision that we feel is important to pay attention to automatically transferable. The example you see before you, and by the way, the option to renew is essentially the mechanism that allows you as a practice owner to essentially have the buyer be provided with term. And the option to renew is very critical to ensure that the option to renew 
is not personal to you. The example before you states that provided that Dr. Joe Black shall remain as a tenant. And this is, by the way, one provision we took out from one of our client's lease agreements. We changed the name of the tenant for confidentiality. And what is provided that Dr. Joe Black shall remain as the tenant mean? What it means is that if you're the selling doctor and there's now a change in tenancy, the buyer of the practice cannot exercise the right to renew the lease agreement. So let's say you have a lease that expires in 2017 and there's an option to renew for five years. them any additional term because what they inherited was only term up to 2017. Now is this a problem? If you're the selling doctor you know, and you really don't care about whether or not the buyer is able to exercise the option, is it a problem? ourselves with advisors, including lawyers and accountants. And if these professionals have a look at your lease agreement and determine that there is an option to renew, but the option is personal to you as the selling doctor, you have a problem on your hands because then they're going to advise their client to devalue the practice accordingly. This option to renew furthermore goes on to say that in order to exercise the option, the landlord needs to be notified no less than nine months prior to the end of the term. So typically if you have an option to renew, it is requiring that you notify the landlord in advance in writing. And the question is, what is the rent rate that's going to be agreed to when you exercise the option? In most of your lease agreements, if you have an existing option to than what you're currently paying, number one. Number two, in many cases, the landlord has the ability to revise the minimum rent to be what they believe to be fair market rent. And fair market rent is essentially any rent that they believe they can solidify by negotiating with another tenant for them to take over your space. Now the problem is that when you have a plumbed at dental office, any associate looking for a location And so this is where we get into you know, what's considered fair market rent and how is that determined. But it's critical that you have to, if you have an option to renew, that option to renew be properly negotiated. Pay that loan they're taking out from the bank. Other important provisions within your dental office lease, I don't have time to go through all of these, uh, but I do want to place emphasis on a few of them. The first one is called demolition, and it's highlighted in red here. And the demolition provision essentially is a provision that states that if the presents challenges for the buyer when they're going to obtain financing because the banks view it as a risk. Um, another provision, I had a doctor, in fact, this morning who I had a conversation with who said, I'm thinking about selling my practice, and I'm on a second floor. There's a, another doctor on the ground floor unit. I'm not practicing, you know, seven days a week, not even five days a week. And, you know, I'm in a financial position where I feel like if I can net something for my practice, I'm going to be happy, but I'm not looking to walk away with, you know, thousands upon thousands of dollars. I, my practice is in high producing, roughly 250000 in production. So, you know, why don't I just sell my patient charts to the other doctor in the building? Seems like a decent strategy if you can get enough money for the patient charts. But one of the things that she hadn't paid attention to was what happens with her current space. Her surrender clause in the lease agreement says that if she doesn't renew the lease or decides to relocate or decides to hand the keys back to the landlord, 
the landlord doesn't want the space in a build-out condition. They want the space in vanilla shell. They want it essentially in a state that they can now market and lease out to any tenant of their choosing, not just the dentist. And if you have this provision like she does in her lease agreement, and you are not even interested in selling your practice, or maybe you're just selling your patient charts, then it's going to be a, a challenge because you're now going to spend money having to gut out your current premises. Another provision is called overholding, right below surrender. And overholding is a provision that basically says, if you as a tenant remain in possession of this space beyond the expiration date of the lease agreement, you're going to pay more rent. Sometimes it's 200% of your current rental rate. Sometimes it's less. It could be 150%. And in some cases, it could be much higher. And here's one of the common misperceptions with respect to term and, and practice sales. Some doctors believe that if I'm going to sell my practice and I have a lease that's coming up for renewal, it's better for me to hold off on renewing that lease agreement because why would I renew that lease and obligate myself to more term if I'm not necessarily sure whether or not I'm going to be able to sell by a certain time? And that's a legitimate you know, argument. But the problem with that philosophy is if, if you decide to essentially continue practicing the location until your lease expires, and then the expiration date comes and you don't renew the lease agreement because right now you're in the midst of negotiating with a prospective buyer and you don't want to obligate yourself to term, when you reach the overholding period, the landlord, your landlord has the ability to charge you more rent. And every single day that goes by, you're incurring additional expenses for holding on to that space. And guess what? Because you're an overholding tenant, the landlord can terminate you within 30 days. So in the end, smart landlords, when they find out that their tenant is looking to sell their office and they hence are not renewing the lease agreement, what a smart landlord would do in that situation is serve the overholding tenant with a termination notice. The overholding tenant is going to immediately panic, approach them with respect to negotiating a deal, say a short-term extension, and they're going to say, put me in. say, I'm happy to take over the space because I'm keenly interested in you know, buying the practice. And they're going to then negotiate with the landlord. But if they're really smart, what they're going to do is they're going to cut you out of the equation completely. They're going to essentially say to the landlord, I'll give you X dollars per square foot. I'll even pay a premium in rent for the current space. Why? Because what's the value of your office? Maybe you have the legal right to rip out your equipment and, and move on. But what the buyer really wants is the location. The patients are going to, a certain percentage of the patients are going to come there naturally because they've been coming there for many years to that same And that never really does anything well for you because you're now forced to either only sell your equipment or uh, essentially decide to find another buyer and then pursue a legal action. Uh, financial statements, you know, I didn't have a chance to talk about financial statements. Too many doctors have lease agreements that allow the landlord to obtain financial statements from them at any given time. Why does the landlord want your financial statements? Would it matter if, uh, let's say, I own a property and a prospective tenant came to me and said, you know, Sina, I've been a tenant here for many years. I've been paying my rent on time. I'm now looking to retire. And... Uh, my lease agreement to this individual. What a landlord does in that situation is the first thing they do is try to gather as much information as possible. And not only do you want financial statements from the prospective purchaser of the practice, but wouldn't it make sense to ask the doctor who's looking to retire, what's your practice producing? Now, do most landlords ask that question directly, or do they say, give me your income statements and let me have a look at your you know, balance sheet? Many landlords ask for that information, and many tenants are under the impression that the landlord is asking for this information. Asking for this information strategically 
to be able to essentially articulate to the incoming tenant why they should pay more rent. If the landlord has access to your financial statements and they can tell that your gross production over the last three years has gone up 8% per year, then they have an argument to make. When it comes time to sell your practice, the question you need to ask yourself is, who is the individual who is going to negotiate my lease agreement? And when you're selling a practice, typically you're working with your accountant and your lawyer. And a practice broker, if you decided to not do a private sale, but really utilize the marketing engine that most practice brokerages provide to be able to market your practice to as many potential buyers and have open houses and, and schedule viewings and have, you know. Assist you with respect to drafting the purchase and sale agreement for your dental office, that they have experience in the dental industry, right? That you can't open up the yellow pages and essentially call any attorney who may have sold other types of businesses and been involved with the you know, transaction from a legal standpoint as far as doing due diligence. So it's very important for that attorney to have specific expertise with respect to advising practice owners. Now, one of the common to negotiate the lease agreement, okay? And I want to differentiate between the two types of contracts. A contract between you and your landlord. So let's go back again. So when you enter into a purchase and sale agreement, the contract is between you and the buyer. Who typically has more leverage in that situation? because there's a limited number of practices for sale and it's very expensive to build a practice from scratch. Typically, the seller has the leverage. Now, even if we forget about that for a second, when your attorney is representing you and if they have experience advising doctors, the agreement they're negotiating is with another doctor, right, or their attorney. But when you're negotiating against a landlord and you're negotiating a commercial lease agreement, that is a specific document that is already drafted by the landlord. How often do you get into a situation, even the young doctors that are attending today's webinar, you may be interested the last several years, very rarely, right? It never almost happens. But with respect to a landlord, the agreement is already drafted. And the problem with it being already drafted is that it is engineered for the benefit of the landlord. And you need somebody who has experience and understands how landlords draft these agreements and how landlords about the real estate industry because drafting a legal contract to sell a business is very different than drafting or negotiating a legal contract that has to do with rental rates and term and tenant and landlord obligations. And so my recommendation is that if you're going to work with a lease negotiator or an attorney, when it comes to selling your practice, work with an attorney who's going to advise you on the term respect to commercial real estate transactions. They couldn't tell you whether or not the $29 a square foot per year that you're paying is above market or below market. They could not tell you whether or not your landlord who happens to be Morgard in Canada or Manny Brothers in California has the type of negotiation power or what they're going to do 
you can essentially transfer the lease and sell your practice without any hiccups. With respect to timing of the negotiation of the lease agreement ahead of the sale, many doctors ask us, Sina, when do I negotiate my lease? The answer is, if you're a current tenant and the for sale sign, you're thinking about maybe selling in the next three to five to 10 years, the ideal time to negotiate a lease agreement is approximately 24 months prior to the expiration date of your current term. I want to say current of more than 12 years of term left? The answer is no, you don't, because your lease expires in 2018. Your option to renew is you and then determine what is the date 24 months prior to that end of term. And that's when you want to contact your landlord and have your representative start negotiating the terms of your lease agreement. Now, if you're looking and you want to determine whether or not it is possible to negotiate despite the fact that your lease may not necessarily expire in the next two years, if you're looking to sell within the next two years. Why do I say that? What if I ahead of you having the practice listed for sale to have a conversation with your landlord about the concern you have with that provision and what if your landlord said to you, we're not planning on changing anything over the next foreseeable future, but you know we like this provision. It gives us additional flexibility. And what if you told your landlord, in turn, that you're willing to pay a little bit more rent to get rid of that provision in your lease agreement? Or perhaps you want to push out the date in which the landlord can exercise to address those problems ahead of the buyer finding out about it. Because I guarantee you that the buyer will find out about it, and when they do, that's not the time to negotiate. Why? Because the landlord knows you're now looking to exit, and why would they agree to anything when you're looking to leave their property? They're going to want to directly deal with the incoming tenant, and what the incoming tenant hears may not be something that they, they like. in the next two years, or alternatively, you're looking to sell your practice within the next two years, the first thing that we try to do is gather all the right documentation. Why? Because if you're negotiating with your landlord, there's nothing uh, Is the version of the lease you have different than the version that the landlord has? It happens, right? You are under the impression that your version is the enforceable version. Once you've gathered all the right documentation, and this is identified in our process wheel, this is the provisions that I discussed. There's many more provisions, and you want to essentially prioritize these provisions, you know, what's most important to me if I'm looking to sell a practice, um, if I'm not looking to sell immediately, and I'm doing market research, and by market research, I mean really looking at and owning it on the rental rates. You know, is the rental rate for the property, does it make sense? If you're in a medical office building, are you overpaying? If you're in a retail strip center, with respect to the rent you're paying today, uh, what are other dentists paying in the area? Does that, does that matter if you're 
So paying attention to that, and what I call a dental office comparables, paying attention to what the numbers are for other practices is, is important because hone in on what are we trying to achieve, right? Uh, with respect to like a chess game. If you come out and you basically make a move immediately and you focus in on one particular provision, like for example transfer, what are you signaling to your landlord? You're necessarily be the best approach you want to take. You may want to distract the landlord from the fact that you're looking to sell the practice. In fact, I would never recommend telling your landlord you're looking to sell the practice until you've been able to find a purchaser and until you've been able to achieve the changes you need in your lease agreement without giving away the fact that you're looking I really recommend that you begin by negotiating rental rates. So what do I mean by that? You know, if you're typically negotiating a lease agreement, you're negotiating both the rent as well as the legal terms. And the reason why we like to negotiate the rental rates first is because that's what landlords want, right? Once you get the rent conversation out of the way, it's a lot easier to negotiate the legal terms within the lease agreement. risk management, and who's going to draft the changes? Is it going to be the landlord, or is, it, or is it going to be your lawyer and your representative? We find that from the work that we've done across North America, landlords typically do not want to take on substantial lease revisions. This is why we draft the provisions that we'd like to see in a lease agreement and redraft the existing clauses uh, to where they want it, we want them to be, and then submit them to the landlord for review and acceptance. Uh, essentially making it a lot easier for the landlord to accept the changes we're asking for. So once we've negotiated the rental rates, then we negotiate the legal terms. And this is where we have to be very careful with respect to what you're agreeing to because uh, it's very possible that the landlord may decide to remove one provision from one section of the lease agreement and reinsert it into a different provision slightly differently um, in a certain area within your lease agreement slightly differently, and that's going to still increase your liability. It may make the practice less attractive for a sale. And once you've gone through the process of negotiating the legal terms, we then finalize the lease agreement. The ability to be able to transfer the lease um, to the buyer, the future buyer of your practice without having any issues. And to summarize with respect to the key takeaways with regards to selling a practice as it relates to the lease agreement, it really is important to know that the lease agreement, if it's not properly you had with the transaction, and your practice may sit on a market for several months. In fact, there's nothing worse than having a practice listed and having it be removed from the market in terms of delisted because you and the landlord cannot come to terms about the fact that you're looking to now assign your lease agreement. Or perhaps you've approached your landlord, they'll agree to assigning your lease agreement, but they want more rent, and the buyer with the growth plans of the practice. And you want to be strategic. You don't get what you deserve. You really do get what you negotiate into your lease agreement. And it's critical to start the process early. Too many doctors, you know, they wait again until, I said before, until the last minute to have a conversation with the landlord with respect to additional term, with respect to the legal provisions in their information that we've presented today
and it's hard to know where to start. And my recommendation is where you want to start off is really by reviewing your lease agreement. If there's nothing else that I want you to do this week is just review your lease agreement if you're currently a practice owner and, and then determine what your lease says. Now, it's hard. You know, it's going to probably put you to sleep, but do it anyways. And if you want some assistance, we're offering every one of you who are attending today's webinar the opportunity to sign up for a complimentary Lots that are available, and we're going to offer those to the first five individuals who respond to us and contact us and want to go ahead and have their lease agreement reviewed. And what we do on our end is we confidentially collect your lease documents. We specifically says and how is it going to impact your ability as a practice owner to sell the practice, to grow the practice, and do what you need to do over the next several years. So chance to digest this information. Again, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank everybody who took the time out of their busy schedule to be part of this webinar, and we hope that if you're looking to sell your practice, that you're very successful in doing so, and that the lease agreement will not be an issue when you decide to transition.